The Puritan Thomas Goodwin once wrote, Let us take God for our portion. Whatsoever else becomes of us, whatsoever befalls us, let what will come, what afflictions, what throbs, what miseries or crosses will come, heaven will make amends for all. Those words excite the soul to remain faithful to God because of the promise they represent. The Lord will lavishly compensate believers for their faithfulness. When the Lord Jesus addressed the Church of Philadelphia, a church that was powerful, obedient, loyal, and enduring, he delivered the same promise. Although the believers in that church were opposed by what Christ calls the synagogue of Satan, they remained faithful to God's word. In response, the Lord Jesus essentially says to them, I have a reward for your faithfulness. I have unbreakable promises that secure your good. By doing so, he undoubtedly roused this church to persevere against their enemies. The first promise Christ gave the church of Philadelphia was that no one could shut them out of heaven because Christ had absolute power over its doors, Revelation 3 verse 8. Furthermore, the Lord had provided an opportunity for this church to bring others through those doors by faith in Christ. Second, the Lord promised that they would prevail over their persecutors and some of their opponents would even be converted, verse 9. After delivering those two promises, Christ continued in the same vein, giving the Philadelphian church assurance of future deliverance and glory. The third promise of this letter reads, Because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I also will keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world, to test those who dwell on the earth. I am coming quickly. Revelation 3 10 through 11. If this promise refers to an actual historical event, we don't know what it was. It's entirely possible that there was a wave of persecution or a natural disaster that occurred in the area or some other catastrophe during which the Lord protected and preserved this church. But if this promise was for a specific hour of testing that faced the Church of Philadelphia, we don't know when it was or what had happened. However, the language Christ used here is vast and sweeping, pointing to a fulfillment beyond just the believers in Philadelphia. Many believe this is the Holy Spirit giving us a look down through redemptive history to a time of severe judgment that the Lord's words here refer to the rapture. In 1 Corinthians 15 verses 51 through 53, Paul describes that future event when Christ will take his church from the earth to heaven. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable must put on imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. In the upper room, Christ told his disciples, Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way where I am going. John 14, 1 through 4. Both of those passages described not yet a future event, but Christ retrieving his people out of the world, catching them up into glory, the rapture, or the catching away of the saints. In 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul describes this event as an encouragement to those mourning the death of other believers. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. While it's unmistakable in scripture that the rapture will occur, 
believers are divided over its timing in relation to other eschatological events, specifically the time of tribulation. In Matthew 24, verse 21, Christ warns his disciples, For then there will be a great tribulation, such has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. The tribulation is a seven-year period marked by the reign of the Antichrist and a series of cataclysmic judgments poured out by God, including the seal, trumpet, and bowl judgments. It is the period of eschatological history that immediately precedes the Lord's return to judge sinners with death and hell, and then establish his millennial kingdom on earth. Now regarding the timing of the rapture in relation to the tribulation, there are several long-standing ideas. Some believe in post-trib, that the church will endure the tribulation and be raptured from the world immediately prior to the Lord's return for the judgment of the world and to establish his earthly kingdom with living believers. Others believe in mid-trib, that the Lord will, in the middle of the tribulation, rapture his church before the fullness of God's wrath is poured out in the final three and a half years. There is also a pre-wrath view, which points to a rapture sometime after the midpoint of the tribulation, but prior to God's final pouring out of his wrath at the end of the tribulation. The other view for which Revelation 3.10 serves as a critical support is known as pre-trib. In this view, Christ's words in verse 10 are a promise that he will rescue his whole church from the hour of testing, the hour which is about to come upon the whole world, to test those who dwell on the earth, the tribulation. The pivotal phrase in the original Greek is to keep from. Pre-tribbers see this as a promise that God will spare the church from his wrath, that he will keep them from it, 1 Thessalonians 1, 9-10. Proponents of the other views interpret this as a promise that God will preserve his church through the tribulation, or at least portions of it. Now, there are some compelling reasons to understand Revelation 3.10 from the pre-trib perspective. First of all, the only other time that Greek phrase appears in Scripture is in John 17, verse 15. During his high priestly prayer, the Lord says, I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. Christ did not pray for his people to merely endure within the grasp of Satan's power, but for them to be kept out of it altogether. In both instances, John is the author quoting directly from Christ. There is no compelling reason to read them with two different meanings. Then there are the implications of interpreting this as a promise of preservation rather than removal. To begin with, Scripture tells us that believers during the tribulation will suffer and be killed for their faith. In what sense, then, would the Lord be keeping his church from the time of testing if they are being slaughtered as well as subjected to the horrors of that period? If it is only a promise of protection from his own wrath, but not the wrath of Satan, hell's demons, and the Antichrist, and the unrepentant world system, that doesn't seem like any comfort. Moreover, if the intent here is that he will simply preserve his church through the tribulation, how do his words apply to believers at Philadelphia, who died long before it ever occurred? The most acceptable understanding of Revelation 3.10 is a gracious promise from the Lord to his faithful church that for their perseverance and obedience to him, they will be spared the fury of his temporal judgment poured out on the earth during the tribulation. In that sense, his words in verse 11, I am coming quickly, are not meant as a warning of judgment as they have been to the other churches. Instead, it is a hopeful look forward to the moment he will retrieve his own out of the world. And we should respond to that glorious hope by echoing John's sentiment at the end of Revelation. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus.